This is our last program for the year 2023 and we're dedicating it to the women who've made outstanding achievements despite the barriers they faced. We begin with the story of Fauzia Libuku. She is a fashion designer from Kenya's largest informal settlement. Opportunities are hard to come by where she is from, but as you're about to hear, that has not got in the way of her pursuing her dream. My mom was against it. She usually told me that fashion is not a career worth working for in Kenya. You cannot be a designer here in Kenya because that doesn't exist, you know. She wanted me to do nursing. I wasn't into it, so I just told her I can't do nursing. I want to do fashion. So she said, if you want to do fashion, then you have to look for ways that you'll go to college and pay for your own fee. So that's what I, I did. Mostly when you come from the slum, you don't get this uh, so many opportunities that other, others get. So like you get girls after high school, they don't know what to do with their lives. They're just here roaming around. But instead of roaming, they can have this platform where they get to create something. I feel like men are part of uh, women fearing to wear what they feel they they will make them look sexy or nice because they will be judged but i want to make women feel comfortable in what they wear they shouldn't fear what they wear for as long as they are comfortable in it there's so many special things about the fashion week. For me, I've gotten the chance to meet with other, other designers and they are challenging me to push myself, to work hard. It also is a community thing, so it's helping so many people and it's creating jobs for people like us, you know. It is now that is something that's helping me pay for things, help my mom. I want to start my own business, my fashion business. I, I want to have so many employees to work for me. I see myself uh, as an upcoming young designer who will be an inspiration for to others. excited about what I do. Yeah, I appreciate my work so much. Thank you so much, Monday Designer, for the amazing work that you've been able to present to us. And what a way also to change the narrative about a place like Kibera. Next, we go to Tamale in northern Ghana, where we met Aisha Baba Isahak. The job she chose to do is considered a man's job. And despite all the criticism, she stuck it out and it's paying off. Brick by brick, Aisha is determined to lay the foundations for her future. A lone woman bricklayer in the midst of a team of men, she's building a wall for their clients. She purposefully chose bricklaying as a career. I decided to choose my work, which is different from others' female work. That's why I choose Bricks Day in Thailand. Breaking into building hasn't been easy. Women bricklayers are close to 0% in Northern Ghana. Even her family and friends were hostile. Her job nearly cost her her marriage. As we talk, she gets emotional. I nearly divorced because of this work. For now, I have two kids and I can afford for them. I pay their school fees. Now my husband is not working. I'm able to feed them. In a patriarchal society like Ghana, 
Aisha is fighting a lonely fight. The idea of women being confined to the kitchen and childbearing still resonates in indigenous communities. To others, young Aisha's career in the bricklaying business is a trailblazing effort. Seeing a young girl like this uh, engaging herself in this construction work is very motivative. And it's, it's, it tells us that if um, so many girls invest themselves or bring themselves into these construction zones, they are able to um, cater a lot and improve their lives. Despite the challenges she faces, becoming a bricklayer has proven to be life-changing for Aisha. Because of this work, I'm able to save money and able to buy plot for myself. And I'm planning the future. I'm planning to build a house in it. One day I can tell a story. Aisha wants to inspire other young women so that they can start building their own stories. And one woman building a story of her own is Cindy Ngamba. She's a boxer from West Africa who competed at this year's European Games in Poland as part of the refugee team. But as you're about to see for yourself, she has a fighting spirit and the obstacles that she's faced outside of the ring only motivate her. Winds like this are bringing Cindy and Gamba closer to her dreams. She was part of the first ever refugee team at the European Games, the latest step towards her ultimate goal. It's the Olympic dream, being, being able to get you know, on the number one stage and everyone looking at me, everyone, everyone watching me. Not only as a refugee, but as Cindy Magamba, the you know someone that that just put the I put the work in. Cindy grew up in Cameroon, but moved to the United Kingdom aged 11. Supported by GB Boxing, she's progressed through the sports ranks, winning major international competitions. Now 24, Cindy would be a medal contender for Great Britain at the Olympics, but she needs citizenship first. It's a long and arduous process. And she thinks politicians could do more for athletes like her. I told you, not only for in boxing, in any other sport, I think a lot of opportunity needs to be put, put into people. I think there's a lot of crisis happening around the world, and you know, and and, and more, a lot, too many excuses that are made. So I think there are eyes. Some eyes are, are blinded. Some eyes are closed, and they act like they can't see. It's more than about the medals, though. Cindy considers the UK her home now. Her sexuality means she wouldn't be welcome back in Cameroon. It's illegal to be gay in my country. If I was sent that, I, get, I can get beaten, I can get uh, in prison, or I can have trouble. Even if I, I do go there and, I, and I'm fine there, I can get, I can, I can, trouble can follow me around just because of my sexuality. And that gives perspective. When she's in the ring, Cindy says she likes to smile, her way of disarming opponents. So what, what I do is I, I smile, and people think I'm crazy. I smile, because I'm thinking well, my body's waking up now, my body's is ready now, my body's telling me, yeah, I'm, I can see it all, I can see it all. I'm ready now. Ready for more success, and if that follows, the smile will surely get even bigger. You're watching DW News Africa with the special end year program honoring remarkable women whose stories we've brought you in 2023. Still to come, Nigeria's junior chess champion. She's set her sights on competing at the top of the game. I just want to learn chess so that at the age of 15 I can be a grandmaster. Also coming up, the Nigerian chef who set a new world record. But first, to a group of women from Cameroon who initiated a platform that is promoting dialogue for peace and reconciliation in the country. The first National Women's Convention for Peace in Cameroon is an alliance with 80 member organizations that represent the 10 regions of Cameroon. They were awarded the 2023 German Africa Prize. Now, Selim Bumien is the founder and the executive director of one of the alliance's organizations. It is called Common Action for Gender Development. Their work focuses on women and girls' rights to reproductive health 
in Bermenda, which is in the English-speaking part of Cameroon, where separatists are fighting to create a state of their own. And this has resulted in years of conflict. Now, Sally joined me in the studio, where she began by telling me about the challenges women are facing in her home city, Bamenda. With the coming of con conflicts in Bamenda, women have lost their source of livelihood. They have gained new responsibility, added burden of caregiving. And they are also at the middle of the conflict because they are being harassed, sexually molested, because part of the dynamics of the conflict is attacking women to show supremacy. So these women have now had multiple roles to carry out. And typically, women in this Bamenda community are women who do uh, subsistence farming for a living or petty trading to be able to feed their families. With this new dy dynamics, these women do, are not able to find themselves coupled with our traditional structures of we women being excluded in leadership. And can you tell us about how, through your foundation, you're helping to address these challenges? Um, Common Action for Gender Development believes in the potential of women and it believes in giving them access by uh, respecting their sexuality and their reproductive health rights. So with all of this, we are struggling to bring together these women to have like support system to discuss with each other, look at what is happening within the community. We try to push these women to bring their voices into spaces where discussions are being taken place. We try to support them to discuss about their, their sexual and reproductive health because we realize it is a core issue that they need to be addressing if they have to uh, attain their full potential. We have these community outreaches where we work in communities. We have community mobilization to respond to governance issues that are taking place within the community because we believe that there is a life post-conflict. And if we don't start preparing women and girls to not look at their sexuality as something to exclude them, but something to include them with some uniqueness yeah. in the whole conversation. Um, I've, I've read a little bit about the work that you're doing and it's really, um, it's inspirational stuff. And I wonder as you sit here today as a community leader, when you look back at all the work that you're doing back home, what are your, what is one of your highlights? Ah, the highlight is like, changing narrative where I got young girls to be able to talk to municipal authorities at the level of the local council, yeah. telling them exactly how they want health services to be given to them, especially the family planning units and the use of contraception within my country. Yeah. I was very happy because that moment, I could lead these girls to be able to evaluate those services by themselves, yeah. make decisions, interact with those who run those services and came up with a policy brief. I felt like, okay, this is it. This is how yeah. people can take their destiny into their hands and discuss the things that concerns them, which is something we can use for any other thematic. Yeah. And Sally, before you go, we have a few moments and I wondered if you could just share with our audience today uh, what this award means to you and for the hundreds of women that you're representing in receiving this award here in Berlin. Women's work is usually some difficult work because of the polemics around what it is, a recognition like this. The award is a recognition, it's a validation of the efforts of Cameroonian women who have been responding to the multiple crises of our community. So it means a lot and it means more work because if we have been recognized with this award, we need to move and continue serving our communities. Salim Bumian, congratulations to you and all the women who've won this award and thank you so much for being on DW News Africa. Thank you very much. Our next story takes us back to Ghana where coastal communities depend on water bodies for their livelihoods, but these vital resources are rapidly losing their beauty and purity due to constant pollution. So to draw attention to the problem, Yvette Tete, an environmental activist, swam 450 kilometers in Ghana's Lake Volta. That's the world's largest man-made lake. She's calling on authorities to urgently preserve water bodies for a cleaner, sustainable future. Activist and entrepreneur Yvette Tete is passionate about Ghana's environment. Proof of that is her swimming through Ghana's Lake Volta for more than 40 days, covering an overall route of 450 kilometers. 
This lake, the world's largest artificial reservoir, is one of the few waterways in Ghana still clean enough for her to swim in. It is so encouraging and so amazing to be able to swim in the Volta River like this. And I'd love to see other water bodies in Ghana, and specifically Accra, be this swimmable again. Tete's expedition was to draw attention to the pollution of Ghana's water bodies, some of which come from second-hand clothing waste. 15 million second-hand clothing items pour into Ghana every week. Over 50 percent ends up in waste heaps, like here in the Kole Lagoon in Accra. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tete's campaign against environmental pollution was organized by the Oil Foundation. Scientist Isabella Bru is part of the team. Her role was to take water samples at various points for testing. In this solar-powered boat, she analyzed the water samples for several elements in this small laboratory. It depends on the places where we are. If we are close uh, to villages, for example, we will be collecting s some samples for bacteriological tests. If we are close to factories or industrial areas, we will be uh, checking for heavy metals, for example. Ghana's water bodies continue to be heavily polluted, largely from mining activities. Managers of the water resources say many of them are in critical condition. They are concerned about the devastating impact. Tete wants to continue to raise public awareness. Her hope is that Ghana's waterways will one day be free of all pollution, not just the rich world's cast-off clothing. And now to the game of strategy that's played by millions around the world. We caught up with one young chess star in Nigeria, Ivie Urito who is sharing her passion for the game to inspire others in her community to play. Meet Ivie Urieto, the next queen of the chess world. She started playing when she was just four. Now she's advancing up the ranks. The eight-year-old is a junior chess champion and ambassador for the game of kings. It helps you to have a strategy. It helps you to think critically. It helps you to control your emotions. It helps you to have a plan A and a plan B. It helps you not to be too comfortable. When school's over, Ivie spends her spare time practicing her moves in the game she loves. Competing against adult opponents is a challenge she enjoys. I feel good when I play chess. Um, if I use a game, let's say I'm playing online, if I lose a game, I always keep fighting till the game is over and there's still another try. Ivie says she discovered the game by watching her father play. Her inspiration was the knight, the only figure that can jump over all the others. Clement, her father, supports her passion, but says it's all about balance. What we have been able to do for her is we, we are managing with a timetable. She's she take a child as she, she eats, you know. We are not really, we are not, uh, we are not forgetting the fact that she's just eight years old. It's just that her love for chess is something that I think is just natural for her. So the pawn moves tricks. At the beginning, it moves two squares and it also moves... Ivier is convinced that chess can make the world a better place and wants to inspire other children to take up the sport. When I'm teaching them, I feel like I'm also learning. This was my first time of playing chess, and it was amazing. And I loved it. Studies suggest that playing chess helps with cognitive development and improves problem solving skills. Her early start means she's just a few moves away from her dream. I just want to learn chess so that at the age of 15 I can be a grandmaster and be teaching people um, in the future. I'll still come and teach them. So maybe when they play with me, um, I might win them. I might not because chess, anybody can win. 
Now this year, a Nigerian chef broke the Guinea's world record for the longest cooking session. 27-year-old Hilda Bassi spent 100 hours making meals in Lagos. Now she was later dethroned by a Japanese chef whose cookathon was 24 hours longer. But nonetheless, Hilda certainly inspired many Nigerians with her attempt. This is the moment of truth for chef Hilda Bassi. The end of a mammoth four-day cooking session. Thousands turned out to egg her on and celebrate her success. Bassi spent 100 hours preparing food to try to break the world record. I genuinely just feel a lot of relief and I'm very happy and I'm very proud. I, the turnout was very unexpected, so that definitely surprised me. She made more than 100 dishes, both international and Nigerian. Her aim was to raise her profile as a chef, but she also has other goals. I have bigger dreams for my business and for my brand and generally just for my name. So just coming from a very, very, very modest background, I just knew that, okay, I need to do something that is basically out of the ordinary to put myself on the map, to put Nigeria on the map, to put young African women on the map. As well as enjoying the party atmosphere, her supporters were able to sample the food Bassi made for free, boosting the feel-good factor at the event. Go, Hilda, go, Hilda, go. Everyone will be talking about being Nigerian for a very, very long time. I feel very proud and honoured, um, and it's, it's um, a pleasure to be here to witness the whole thing. Whatever comes next for Chef Bassi, She's already hit on a recipe for success. That's for sure. Let's take to the skies in Kenya now, where we met Joyce Beckwith, the world's first black female hot air balloon pilot. The trailblazer has been taking tourists on safari with a unique perspective of the treasured Maasai Mara Wildlife Reserve. The Maasai Mara by air a spectacle from above one of Africa's most famous national parks. For Captain Joyce Beckwith, it's just another day in her office in the skies. She became the world's first licensed black female hot air balloon pilot in 2019. Colleagues call her Captain Smiles. I knew that I was going to be the Kenyan, the first Kenyan uh, pilot, uh, female pilot to get the balloon, but I did not realize that I was actually going to be the first black woman in the world to do this. Captain Smiles earned her license at a special flying school in the United States. Since then, she spends most of her mornings showing people the heart-stopping magic of sunrise above the Masai Mara. The ride costs $400 per person, a luxury only few can afford. Like Kenyan stand-up comedian Eunice Vanjiru, a.k.a. Mamito. She gifted the ride to herself on a birthday. I flew with Captain Smiles and let me tell you, she's amazing. She's excellent at what she does. Flying and telling you the animals at the same time, that's amazing. And she knows them from afar. Captain Smiles has already logged 200 hours of flying, but more importantly, she has broken through a glass ceiling for women in aviation. When I am flying, I can only describe it as freedom. I can describe it as, um, gosh, it's, you just have to fly. You just have to come fly with me to, to, to know what I'm talking about. And many hope to with Kenya's very own trailblazer.